Hi friends, it's Crystal Beshara here. In this painting of mine called February Blues, I want to take you through some of the process and give you a little bit of insight and behind the scenes work at how to achieve some of these glowy, snowy effects. To take some of the guesswork out of your color mixing, I've created a series of color recipe cards that you can download from my website. Achieve more harmony, balance, mood, and atmosphere by using these easy to follow instructional cards. Learn more or download them now by clicking here. For full length video tutorials that you can own, check out my website link at crystalbeshera.com slash shop videos. I always start with a basic sketch without any shading, just really simple contour outlines. I'm working on 140 pound cold pressed paper, which has just a really nice tooth. It's 100% rag paper. I'm using a mechanical pencil here, but any 2H pencil would be perfect. Just make sure that it's nice and sharp. You can see that I'm using a pretty light and sketchy touch when I'm sketching out the barns and the trees. I'm trying to indicate as many familiar shapes as possible. Now you don't have to draw absolutely everything and we certainly don't want to shade. We want to focus on exterior or what we call contour lines. The main outer shapes are important to record so that we know and we can set some parameters within which to paint. This whole painting will be set at golden hour and for that reason, I am going to be toning my whole paper with a little bit of color to start. And to do so, I'm just taking my one inch wash brush and wetting the surface of the paper. This will allow my paint to move freely and with ease over the surface and not end up looking patchy. The water, if you're familiar with my other videos, is something also that creates a nice skin on the surface of the paper and that allows the paint to float without penetrating or staining the paper right away. Right now I'm just using a really nice wash of raw sienna and I'm keeping the paint super fluid. I'm painting right over the barns and I'm adding a little bit of rose color. In this case, it's a permanent rose and that's just going to turn everything into a nice peachy hue. I'm taking that rose color all the way down into the snow and just letting it ease off my brush and fade out towards the bottom so that it has a nice peachy glow. Now I'm going into some phthalo blue which will be a part of the sunset sky. That along with ultramarine is going to create a really pretty mixture. And notice that I kept that upper portion of the sky white and now I'm taking the two and integrating them together. If I had toned that upper portion in the raw sienna, everything would have taken on a little bit of a murky brown or greenish tint. The paper at the bottom is still really wet, so I'm able to just take the ultramarine and float that from the bottom up. Again, notice how I left a portion white, and that allows me to have a nice clean transition between the two colors, instead of having any influence from the first color that I lay down. It doesn't matter what direction you brush your strokes in. As long as the paper's really wet, you'll end up with a nice flawless surface and the paint will continue to redistribute itself and soften as time goes on. I take my tissue next and just twist it into a small point so that I can blot and lighten any areas that are still active to keep them pale. After a really wet and saturated wash like this, I do like to use my hairdryer to flatten the paper back out and that keeps it from buckling. And a way to test to see how it's doing is just gently push on the surface. If it doesn't bounce, then it's nice and tight and flat against your paper and ready to work on for the next layer. 
I'm going to be doing some masking on top of this initial layer of snow and color. And to do that, I want to use my masking fluid. I like using the Pebeo drawing gum and I always use a synthetic brush for this. Before doing so, I wet my brush and swirl my brush around in some soap and then wipe the excess soap off. I can then dip in the masking fluid and know that my bristles are nice and protected before I start. Now, I've only got a certain amount of time to work with here before the masking fluid dries up on my brush. So I do wanna make sure that I'm working quickly and I'm taking time to rinse my brush, re-soap and reapply the masking fluid as needed. I'm trying to keep my strokes here nice and sketchy and natural looking. The more pressure I apply with my brush, the thicker the lines will be, the less pressure, the finer and more detailed the work can be. Also, you wanna keep in mind how much masking fluid is on your brush. If you really loaded your brush, big blobs will come down. And if you have less on your brush, you'll be able to get thinner and finer results. Once the masking fluid has dried, it's safe to paint on top. And in this case, I just wanna add a little bit more color to the lower part of the snow and I want this to be really soft and flawless. So once again, I do need to pre-wet the surface. Because it's dried and had a chance to really set into the paper, there's no risk of reactivating the paint that's underneath. Here I'm applying another layer, or a glaze as we call it, of permanent rose. And I'm just floating that down on the very wet surface. I'll be bringing back in a little bit more ultramarine blue just to make things a little bit more contrasted and richer and really just more saturated. Once again, if your paper surface is still really wet, you can change direction to kind of redistribute the paint and this will give you a really nice soft result, providing you don't go back in as it's drying up. Now I'm elongating some shadows from the trees and some of the elements on the horizon. Once again, this was a really wet application and I don't want to risk my paper warping or buckling. So drying it up with the hairdryer will speed up that process and keep those valleys from forming. Now it's safe to go ahead and paint the upper portion of the little farmstead. And I'm starting with some raw sienna and it's on a dry surface. This is going to give me a lot of control over my shapes and you can see I'm using my number 10 designer blend. It's a beautiful brush that's very round and has a really great belly, it holds a lot of paint, but comes to a nice point. So that allows me to cover broad areas, but also some really nice delicate areas as well. Now I'm just dropping in some burnt sienna and letting that flow wet into wet, right into those tiny little shapes. This will give a little bit more dimension to the facades of the buildings. Now I'm switching to my fan brush and I'm working on a slightly dampened area. I'm using upward strokes because the bristles taper as they lift off the paper and that way I don't end up with blunt results. I'm using my Fling, which is a synthetic fan brush, and it is just a dream to work with. Many of you have already picked one up from me. The link is in the description below, and I'm also adding it here to the screen. It's awesome because the bristles stay really splayed, and that's ideal when you are painting distant tree lines, individual branches, grasses, or even bare trees as I'm doing here. I can use one little single frond from it, just one little spike on the corner, or I can use the whole breadth of the brush depending on the volume and the type of shape that I want to create. 
I love using a fan brush because it always gives me lots of really wonderful negative shapes. Now I'm just dropping in a beautiful mixture of burnt umber and violet and I'm allowing the raw sienna to stay along the edges, adding a bit of contrast here, but nothing too extreme at this point. I want everything to be really fluid, natural, and have that beautiful amber glow. So you can see how detailed I can get with this fan brush. Even though it's about one inch in breadth, I can just switch and pivot the bristles and choose exactly where I want to make contact with my paper. Here I'm adding some Hooker's Green Dark to the tree line and that's just going to give a bit more depth and I'm letting it flow naturally and just really focusing on shadow and volume and mass, not individual trees at this point. You know I love using violet for my shadows, so to deepen this Hooker's Green Dark combination, I'm adding a bit of violet and that's really going to read as deep dark shadows, especially at this time of the day. There's not a lot of definition here, we're keeping it soft. And I'm just dragging some of that color upward to integrate it a little bit more into that initial foundation. I can add or take away by blotting. It's completely fluid and I'm really just looking at what my painting needs. I'm looking at the photo as inspiration, but I really am just trying to decide what the shape along the horizon asks of me. Here I'm painting a really large individual evergreen and I'm using my fan brush once again, just really relying on that beautiful splay of bristles and flicking out from the core or the center of the tree and bringing those branches outward and upward. Notice how I have upward strokes at the top and then ever so slightly downward strokes at the bottom of the tree. While that raw sienna color is still wet, I drop in the other silhouette colors. So a little bit of violet, a little bit of green, maybe some burnt umber, and this will just give that core way more depth and shadow. But the outside of the tree, those beautiful edges are just sunlit and have this little aura around them and that really is what makes this whole thing glow. Now I'm starting to paint the roof of the barn. Remember I still have my masking fluid on the barn and that is protecting the color of the snow and the underpainting underneath so I can freely paint over top and just rely on that beautiful texture that was created initially with the masking fluid. I'm just flip-flopping between raw sienna, burnt sienna, violet, and just making sure that this is a dynamic range of color and not just a boring old gray. I love working from light to dark and so here I'm just adding a little bit more contrast, increasing the saturation of values and really keeping the tones and the hues on the warm side. When your paint dries, the colors always look a little less potent. And so I'm bringing back a bit more saturation and a bit more contrast into this beautiful tree, just working on dry now and flip-flopping between my fan brush and a small fine brush, like a rigger or liner or a number one, and just building some of that crunchy, juicy shadow.
We saw how it looked when I painted on dry with our last tree, and now I'm going to show you how it looks when I paint on wet with the shadows. Notice how the paint just disperses and flows really effortlessly. That gives a really nice soft effect. My fence posts are still masked out. In fact, the whole ridge of snow is still masked. It will be something that I take off at the very last minute. I'm bringing in some alizarin crimson here just to make a bit more variation in the greens. I love the way that the hooker's green dark and the alizarin crimson integrate with one another. Because they are complementary colors, they make the other a little darker and the two also, because they're cooler, give a bit of a violet effect, which of course is wonderful for shadows. It's time to remove the masking fluid, so before we do so, I want to make sure that all of my paint is completely dry. Now, if I'm taking masking fluid off of a large area, I like using my rubber cement pickup, which is this funny little block. Again, the links for all of these products are down in the description box below. So you can see how white that looks compared to the colored parts that I filled in, even though we had a little bit of a tone underneath. There's always a bit of touch up to do once you remove the masking fluid and this is no exception. I'm just toning and refining some of the masked areas, softening the edges with paint or increasing the contrast as in the case here as I add more color to the roof. One of my favorite things to do at the finishing stage is to add some cast shadows. And I've added some to the snow and now I'm adding to the buildings themselves as well. And notice what this glaze does to the white. It just tints it down a little bit and really creates a beautiful effect. Adding some more glazes and shadows to the snow just to liven things up a little bit. A true glaze is working with a wet, transparent paint on top of a dry surface. Lifting out your highlights, especially for a snowy landscape, is a really beautiful and effective way to create a glowing surface. And this is done using my Ivory Filbert brush. It's stiff like a hog's hair brush, but it's a little bit more supple in that there's a softness to the bristles and it's not as uh, aggressive on the paper surface. So using a bit of water on my brush, I'm able to lift off some of that surface pigment and then blot with some tissue to take away any pigment that's accumulating on the edges. This was a really nice finishing touch for this watercolor painting of mine entitled February Blues. And it just gives a bit of a gentle undulating surface effect. This works really well with liftable colors. If you're using a staining color, this lifting effect is going to be a lot more challenging. If you've enjoyed the process and seen some of the behind the scenes tools and techniques that I use for my painting February Blues, please let me know in the comments below. For the complete list of art tutorials that I have available, visit my website, www.crystalbashera.com slash shop videos. Thanks for watching everybody and happy painting as always. See you the next time.